Hello, and we're going to look at the Ford 6F50 and the GM 6T70 transaxle. And this first presentation here is going to focus primarily on the mechanical operation and power flow. The GM 6T70 and the Ford 6F50 are pretty much the same transmission. When you look at them internally, there's a lot of similarities. Not all the parts are interchangeable. As a matter of fact, a lot of the hard parts are not interchangeable, but there are a lot of things that are the same, like thrust washers, uh, clutch plates, some clutch plates like pressure plates, not all of them. Um, even things like pistons and so forth, they're going to be the same between both units. But that's about where the similarity ends. The You can't interchange gear set parts, you can't interchange drums and, and so forth, but they'll look a lot alike. They're very similar in design and they basically worked together, Ford and GM worked together when designing this transmission but they just kind of split to their own ways when they decided to build their transmission. So, And the same thing holds true for the GM 6T30-40-45 and the Ford 6F35. They're basically the same regarding operation as well. They're just smaller units, and we'll see that here in a second. One of the things that you'll see that's different is that GM places their TCM in the transmission on the valve body. It's called a TECM. Transmission Electro Hydraulic Control Module. And uh, Ford uses an external TCM, similar to what most manufacturers would do. As I mentioned before, a lot of the parts are not interchangeable, but some parts are, so you definitely want to check that out before you start experimenting and swapping components between the two units. Small units versus large units, there's going to be a few key differences. As a matter of fact, when you disassemble a smaller transmission like a 6T40, and then you disassemble like a 6070. There's a lot of differences in the way they're configured. They still have the same power flow and mechanical operation, but that's kind of where some of the similarities end. Uh, the way the design, like for example, the 6T40 does not have an end cover, whereas the 6T70 does. So you have to split the transmission case in half to get to the parts in the 6T40, whereas you can get most of those gear set parts, or all the gear set parts out really, for the 6070 right through the end cover. So there's a lot of differences in the way they design the case. And I'm sure it's just mainly for either weight, uh, cost savings, you don't have as much torque on a smaller unit torque capacity. That's what that number stands for, like the, the 6T40, 40 is the torque capacity, whereas the 6T70, 70 is the torque capacity. The higher the number, the higher the torque capacity. The six would obviously mean speeds. T means transverse or transaxle. So like a 6L80 would be a 6-speed longitudinal with an 80 torque capacity. And a 6T45 would be a 6-speed transaxle with a 45 as the torque capacity. Well, the smaller units, they design the oil pump differently. They actually have it converter driven. And that's, you know, pretty typical of a lot of transmissions. That There's really nothing new that we uh, think of when we think of like a, a converter driven oil pump. So we look over here, the torque converter would come in and drive this inner pump gear. The hub on the torque converter would. No big deal. But on the larger units, they have a chain driven setup. So this would be pretty much the center line where the torque converter is flying into. And you have a sprocket and that would deliver torque to this chain. And there would be a chain driven sprocket. Uh, on the oil pump. So it's an off access oil pump is what we would consider that. So they don't need to kind of um, have the thickness of the oil pump incorporated into the front of the transmission. They can kind of deliver it off to the side through a chain and a sprocket. And then that way they can kind of reserve some of that space for maybe a bigger gear or something like that. Because, you know, in an, uh, with a vehicle, you're going to have you're, you're going to have an engine in there, right? Let's just say that simulates an engine viewed from the front. It's transverse. And then you're going to have to have your transmission in there somehow. We only have so much width that you're allowed to have in, the, in a vehicle. So if you got a fairly large engine and you need a big stout transmission, you're going to run out of space real quick. So there, space is a priority so that they can chop an inch off here and an inch off there. That's good because then they can um, you know, make a more compact unit, fit it into a smaller vehicle, all that good stuff. One of the ways they do that also is through this chain drive. The smaller units actually use a chain drive, kind of like a transfer case would in a four-wheel drive vehicle. So the torque uh, goes in through the input shaft, goes through the gear set, comes out through this output gear, and delivers that torque through a chain to the final drive. 
Whereas in a gear driven setup or on the larger unit, you have a gear driven setup. So that torque ends up going to this transfer gear, delivers it to that transfer gear, delivers it to the pinion, delivers it to the um, final drive assembly. A little bit different setup. Um, but, you know, like I said, the smaller units don't have to handle as much torque and uh, it works well for that. Some of the other things that we could think of, just not obviously going to help you diagnose or fix a vehicle, but just what this transmission is about. The 6F50 is a 220 pound transmission. You can see the gear ratios between the 6F50 and the 6T70 are listed here is the same. I guess it's possible you might find some differences. You got a pretty big jump when you go from first gear to second gear, and then it becomes less and less of a jump. Our overdrive is not a crazy overdrive. Uh, it's 0.74 to one um, you know that's pretty modest by most overdrive transmissions now they're really higher a lot higher than that but uh, and then the smaller units have a little bit different gear ratio you can see I've got a little bit lower of a first gear slightly lower of a second um, slightly lower of a third and then you know pretty much the same overdrive but um, so you know you're gonna have similar gear ratios it still has a pretty good jump from first to second but that's about it. When we look at our range reference chart, one of the things to note is that Ford likes to use, they've kind of stuck in their old ways of calling things forward, intermediate, and direct, and all that stuff. So you'll see some terminology used that's different on the Fords. This is GM tor terminology. They just, they make it simple, as long as you can remember the numbers. They label the clutch with what gear they're used. So they have the 456 clutch, that's a driving clutch. They have the 35R clutch, which is also a driving clutch. So these are both input clutches right here. And then the other clutches are holding clutches. So we've got the 2.6 and low reverse, low one-way roller. They call it a low and reverse clutch, a low and reverse one-way roller clutch, but it's um, only holding in low. So I don't know why they stuck that reverse in there. And in the videos, like the overhaul video, I caught myself calling it not only a low reverse all the time, I also call it a roller all the time, and it's not a roller clutch. It's sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a diode or a ratcheting clutch, uh, a pawl type clutch. So it doesn't have roller bearings in it or sprag elements in it. It has little ratchets, just like your ratchet that you use that you got in the toolbox where you hear it clicking. That's the design it has, and Ford's been using that for a while, so it's nothing new as far as that's concerned. But um, it is a little, it's a little different. And then our one, two, three, four clutch, that is also. So all these are holding clutches. Now Ford likes to call these things a little different. Like sometimes they'll call that the overdrive clutch. They'll call this the direct. They'll call this the intermediate. Um, they'll keep low and reverse with those. And then actually they will call this just a low, the one way roller, they call it a low. And then they call the one, two, three, four, the forward. That's pretty much carried over from their old school days, other than the overdrive, back when they would, you know, like the C6 transmission and all that kind of stuff. They'd stuck, stick with just a basic terminology like that. Direct meaning it's used in direct drive, which fifth gear is direct drive. Intermediate used to be second gear on the old transmissions, but I guess they just carried that over because it's second. One, two, three, four, it's used in the forward gear ranges. <laughs> so in the old days, they had a forward clutch that was applied in first, second, and third. Well, those were the only forward gears they had, so they call it a forward clutch. Uh, anyway, so now down here it says, there's an asterisk that says speeds above six miles an hour. And you can see the, um, the low reverse clutch is applied. And actually, I don't see the asterisk there. It's, they have it in neutral and in park, which is kind of weird. But what they basically do is they apply the low reverse clutch when you take off in first gear, and then as soon as you get above a certain miles an hour, I think it's three miles an hour or six miles an hour, depending on the manufacturer, it releases the low reverse clutch. And then you're stuck with just only using the low roller assembly. Um, so, Anyway, that's the reason why you'll see that. So they, they leave the, since they have it on in park and they have it on in reverse, they could just pretty much have this thing applied as soon as you start it up. And then they know that what you're going to do is you're going to shift into reverse or drive. 
So you can leave that clutch applied so that way when you shift into, let's say, let me erase all this, but let's say you go to shift into, you're in park and you go to shift into drive, the only thing they have to do is apply this one, two, three, four clutch because they already have the low reverse clutch applied. And, but the one way roller clutch is also holding. So as soon as you start moving, they just go ahead and release that over a certain speed before they shift in the second. Now, if you ended up shifting from park into reverse, you already had the low reverse clutch applied. So all they had to do is apply the three, five R clutch. So that reduces the amount of delay that you might have when trying to engage a gear. Also maybe uh, eliminates, reduces maybe the shift, garage shift engagements. We call the shift when you're basically taking out a park or neutral and the vehicle's not moving and you're placing it into drive or reverse. We call that a garage shift because you're not moving and you're placing it in gear. So if you have a, a weird symptom like a bump or a, a slide, like it seems like it's grabbing and then it slams in the gear or just a long delay, uh, you know, you can identify that and say that's the garage shift causing that problem. And then you'll focus your, th your, you know, like your attention. In this case, you'd focus your attention onto the one clutch that's applying. But if we had more than one clutch that's applying, then we would have to look at multiple clutches. So they eliminate that garage shift issue by basically having one of the two necessary clutches applied uh, to begin with. And it works out well. This little drawing that I have here kind of represents the three planetary gear sets and all the clutches that are in this transmission. And it takes a little bit to get used to, so I'll break it down here for you. Now in this class, in the, in the, in the class, you went through the 41TE, so you already saw this. So you probably are familiar with what I've got going on. But in case you forgot, in red, I got the input shaft. So if we look at the input shaft here, torque is gonna come in through the input shaft it's gonna pass through this first gear set. So this is the first gear set towards the front of the transmission. And this is a sun that's in the middle. This is the planetary carrier. And then this is the internal gear, or ring gear, or whatever you wanna call it. I'll call it ring gear, because it's shorter to spell. And then, so this is gear set number one. There's gear set number two. And I'm just numbering these. It's not like they have that in a service manual or anything, but I've got a ring gear on it. I got a planet on it, and I have a sun. And then this is gear set number three. I got a ring, planet, sun. So I got three planetary gear sets. They're all kind of, um, I won't call them independent because you could see some common connections. Matter of fact, let's talk about that next. I'll erase this. If they're the same color, that means they're connected some way or another. They're lugged together, or splined together. So you can see right off the bat that the planet in the middle gear set, or the gear set number two, is also connected to the ring gear on the front gear set. And you can see that the planet on the rear gear set, it's supposed to be a P, is connected or spline to the ring on the middle gear set. And you could see that the, well, I guess that's it. But, um, okay, uh, let me erase that. So those are common connections. No, actually there's one more. The, the output gear, we've got the front planet and the rear ring gear, they're common. So if you're, you're holding one, you're holding both. If you're driving one, you're driving both. So if there's a common connection, and let's just use this, for example, the low one-way clutch, if it holds this ring gear in the middle, it's also gonna hold this rear carrier. Right? I've been calling that a planet. It's a planetary carrier. And um, if I end up driving that like you can see back here, this four, five, six clutch has the ability of driving this rear carrier. You can also drive this middle ring gear. So that's where the kind of the magic of these planetary gear sets come into place because they, you know, you have three planetary gear sets there and one planetary gear set has the ability of creating six underdrives and overdrives, but you can't get six usable underdrives and overdrives. And then if you've got something connected to an output shaft where you've just really reduced uh, all your options there. So in order to get six usable speeds, forward speeds, and a reverse, 
we've got three planetary gear sets here and they have it configured this way. So also let's kind of keep going with the way this drawing set up here. If you look, I say transmission case up here and then I have these arrows. So this two six clutch, we can, when we apply the clutch, the two six clutch, it's gonna lock this rear sun to the case. And when we apply our low reverse clutch, we're going to lock the middle internal ring and then the, um, you know, the carrier. We're going to lock it to the case so it can't spin. Same thing with the low one-way clutch. And actually the one, two, three, four clutch, you can see it can lock the front sun gear to the case, prevent it from spinning. So those are all of our holding clutches. So that's why it says transmission case up there is because that's what a holding clutch is going to do. When it applies, it's going to stop a gear set part from spinning. And then my two input clutches, which I only have the two here. Uh, it's kind of made it pretty simple as far as this transmission. Uh, these are all input right over here, right? So my input clutch, my four, five, six, has the ability of driving the rear carrier. and the middle ring and the 35R has the ability to drive in the rear sun. Now one thing that's noted here is if you look this middle sun gear it's the same color as the input shaft so the middle sun gear is always spline to the input shaft so it's always input. So now when we go through the power flow we'll look at specifically what's being held what's being driven and what's being output. Because there's some situations where there's really only one gear set part being driven or something like that. Um, and it's, it's usually the gear reduction from one gear set is feeding a gear reduction in another gear set. They multiply together to create an overall gear reduction. But we'll see that here coming up. Okay, so looking at first gear to begin with, this is one of those examples where you've got one gear set working in a gear reduction is feeding another gear set working in a gear reduction. So my input as drawn, my input comes in here and I'm driving my sun gear. So I'm going to put a big I on the sun gear because that's input. And you can see my low reverse clutch and my low one-way roller clutch is holding, they're holding my internal gear. So I'm going to put an H that represents holding, right? So that means my middle carrier is output. So I've got a sun gear that's input, a middle sun that's input, a middle ring gear or internal gear that's held. And my output is in a gear reduction on that carrier. If you take a look where that carrier does, it feeds the front gear set. So now as far as the front gear set is concerned, the internal gear is my input. My one, two, three, four clutch is applied, so my sun gear is held. And my carrier is the output. And lo and behold, the carrier is the output of the gear set, so it ends up driving the, you know, through the final drive and transfer gears and all that, it starts, it, it, that's what ultimately delivers my first gear re ratio. So I have a small gear outputting a large gear, and then I have a medium gear, medium, outputting a large gear. So I've got these two uh, gear reductions going on. The best gear reduction I can get out of the middle gear set driving a minimum gear reduction out of the front gear set. We multiply those two together and you end up getting first gear. In first gear, I'm gonna have my one, two, three, four clutch applied. I'm gonna have my low reverse clutch holding. Actually, both of these are holding. So my low, my low one-way roller clutch is gonna hold and the low reverse clutch. They actually keep the low reverse clutch on until a few miles an hour, then they release it and just let the low roller hold this. And then my one, two, three, four clutch assembly is going to hold that front sun gear. And then this is what my gear reduction would be. If you look at the speed difference between the input shaft and this output assembly for the gear set, this is going to deliver the output to the transfer gears and the final drive and all that good stuff. And this is splined directly to the front carrier and rear internal gear assembly. So it's like a carrier rear internal gear assembly is the output of this gear set. So I'm going to go ahead and put my fingers on the low reverse um, where the low reverse clutch would hold on to and then one, two, three, four. And you can see this is my gear reduction. So how fast you see the input sp spinning versus how fast this output assembly is going, that is what 
the first gear ratio would be. So now when we shift to second gear, we're going to look at things a little differently. If you remember in first gear, this middle gear set was the first gear reduction that we kind of had in the, in the uh, lineup here. If you remember, the sun gear was input, the internal gear or ring gear, whatever you want to call it, is held, and my carrier was output. So you're going to see this happen. It even happens a lot of different transmission designs. So that's the best gear reduction we can get out of this planetary gear set. Small gear driving to big gear, the big gear being the planetary carrier. So what we're going to see when we shift in the second, they're going to take this held in ring gear assembly and they're going to start rotating it. And the way they're going to rotate it is we're going to get a little bit of a gear reduction occurring in this rear gear set by holding this rear sun gear. So we hold this rear sun gear, the output gear is going to act like it's inputting a little bit because it's rotating. We're driving down the road in first gear. So this, remember everything here on my front carrier and my rear internal, they're all spawned to the same, they're, they're connected together through that gear set. So driving down the road, my rear gear set is kind of saying, all right, my sun gear is held and I'm going to use my rotating internal gear, which is spawned to the output shaft. I'm going to use that as input to this gear set. And that's going to cause my carrier to spin in a gear reduction. So it's going to take this middle gear set that in first gear was held, and now it's going to be rotating a little bit. So I just stole a little bit of that gear reduction away. Because I had, remember, input on my sun and output on my carrier, that's still happening. But instead of having internal gear that's just held stationary, I'm rotating it a little bit. Mm, and that stole a little bit of that gear reduction. So then what happens is I've got a little less of a gear reduction on that middle gear set. I'm still doing the same thing. This The front uh, internal gear is spinning a little faster. I still have a hold, hold, I still have a held front sun gear. So now my output is going to go a little bit faster. There you go. So my one, two shift occurred because I took this ultimate gear reduction that I have with a held in, uh, middle internal gear and a inputted sun gear, the best gear reduction I could get, and I started rotating that held part just a little bit. And what caused that middle internal gear to rotate a little bit was the action that was happening on that rear gear set after applying the 2.6 clutch. So, I know it's confusing and all, but uh, it's kind of brilliant at the same time too. When I shift in the second, I'm going to release my low reverse, or in, in, in the case of the uh, roller clutch, it would just start freewheeling, because you're going to see this little how about this lug assembly right here? It's going to start rotating clockwise when, I, when the 2.6 clutch stops that rear sun gear. So if you remember, the low roller is going to prevent it from spinning counterclockwise, but it won't prevent it from spinning clockwise. And that's what the low roller is going to allow to happen when I'm operating in second gear. So my 1, 2, 3, 4, and my 2.6. So basically, as soon as I apply my 2.6 clutch, my low roller freewheels. All they have to do to get a 1-2 shift is apply the 2-6 clutch. So all they had to do when they shifted from first to second is apply a 2-6 clutch. They had the low uh, one-way clutch assembly. It was doing its job of holding that carrier and that you know, middle ring gear assembly. It was doing its job just fine. Uh, but as soon as we applied that 2-6, that one-way roller clutch started freewheeling. And they like to do that. They, the, meaning the manufacturers like to do that because the one two shift is probably one of the shifts that has the most drivability complaints. It's because there's torque multiplication going on and also because you're going at low speeds. So any kind of weird bump or uh, issue you probably will feel and um, complain about. So you're better off having a transmission where you don't have to release something and apply something. And when you're upshifting and downshifting, if you could just apply a clutch and you could just control the application and make it nice and smooth, then you're going to have a less, there's going to be less likely that you're going to have a shift complaint. So they do that with this 1-2 shift. By applying that 2-6 clutch, they let that roller just start to freewheel, and then they only have to concentrate on that 2-6 clutch application. Now let's look at third gear. One of the things that changed in third gear is if you remember that rear gear set, uh, I was holding this rear sun, and I was using this internal gear as kind of an input, because it's part of, the, even though it's part of the output shaft, since it's being driven and you're driving down the road, uh, it's, it's the input to this rear gear set, basically. So I had this held, and then my output was the carrier assembly in kind of a medium gear reduction, if you will. So what they do now 
is it's still happening. So, but instead of holding the uh, rear sun gear, now they're driving it at input shaft speed. So I have a rear sun gear being input. It's, it's, it's another, it's an input device. I also have a rotating, I'm going to call it a reaction component, uh, a reaction gear, if you will. And that is going to cause this carrier assembly to speed up a little bit. If you're cause going back to first gear, this was held. In second gear, it started rotating a little bit. And in third gear now, it's going to rotate even more. It's going to be going faster. So I'm stealing more of my gear reduction away from my middle gear set. So I'm forcing this middle carrier and this uh, front internal gear assembly to start slowly spinning faster every time I shift. So now I'm spinning my internal gear a little bit faster. I'm still holding my uh, sun gear assembly, but now I've just sped up my output shaft there a little bit more. So the idea is, um, you know, every time I upshift, I lose some of that gear reduction that I had. And they're doing that by changing the speed of this rear gear set, which ends up changing the speed of the overall gear reduction I'm getting in my middle gear set, which ends up speeding up my input to the front gear set. So for third gear, I have to release my 2.6 and apply my 3.5R clutch. So I release this holding clutch and then I drive it at input shaft speed. So I'm gonna use this hand to do it because I can't still hold the one, two, three, four and drive the input shaft and drive the three, four out, have three hands. You can probably figure that out by looking. So I'm gonna continue to hold the one, two, three, four clutch and my input shaft is gonna drive the 3.5R clutch, which is going to drive that rear sun. And this is going to be the th third gear rotation, third gear gear reduction. That's true, I don't have three hands. Made it a little bit difficult to do that. But uh, yeah, you got the 3.5R as an input. You got the middle sun gear as the input. And I still have the 1, 2, 3, 4 holding in the front. So what happened in fourth gear is that we released the 3.5R, which was driving my rear sun gear, and now I've applied my 4.5.6. By driving my 4.5.6 at input shaft speed, I'm driving this rear carrier. Well, if you remember, what's connected to the rear carrier is my middle internal gear. So it's now driving input shaft speed. Well, my middle sun gear is driving input shaft speed because it's always connected to the input shaft. It's spline to it. There's no way to disconnect that. So that means my middle gear set is operating in a one-to-one, -one, it's direct drive. So that engine, basically input shaft speed is being delivered to that front internal gear. I am still holding this um, uh, front sun gear assembly through the one, two, three, four clutch. And now my gear set is output, but at um, basically I'm just using just this planetary gear set as the gear reduction at this point. So um, whatever the fourth gear ratio is, is really the ratio of that front gear set when an internal gear or the middle medium sized gear is driving the large gear. If you remember on the previous gears, just to kind of reiterate what I've said pretty much on every gear so far, the idea in first gear is to get that gear reduction to be as the greatest gear reduction you can on that middle gear set. And every time we upshift it, steal some of that gear reduction away. So that way the input to this front gear set becomes less and uh, well, becomes faster and faster and faster. And then the overall gear reduction between the two gear sets becomes less and less and less. So now here we are in fourth gear where we're pretty much seeing just the gear reduction on that front gear set. Fourth gear, I'm going to release the 3.5R and I'm going to apply my 4.5.6, which drives this hub right here towards the middle. And that is going to be fourth gear. In fifth gear we've got direct drive so this is the one gear where you don't see the one two three four clutch doing anything because it's finally released. It gets to take a break. But what we look is at this back gear set now and remember this internal gear or this ring gear and this back gear set it is part of the output gear. So what happens to this rear gear set is there is a connection to the output of this whole gear set assembly. So if I'm driving my sun gear at input shaft speed and I'm driving my rear carrier assembly at input shaft speed, guess how fast the rear internal gear has to go? 
So this is this output gear set is going one to one at this point because this rear gear set is doing all the work. It's two parts input, nothing held, that's direct drive. So that's probably the easiest gear ratio to understand in this whole transmission. In fifth gear, I finally get to release my one, two, three, four. I'm not holding this anymore. And I'm gonna apply my three, five R. So we have two parts input, two parts driving and nothing held. You could probably imagine that gear is my direct drive gear. Everything spins as a unit in that gear. Even if it doesn't look like it is, that's what it would do. It's just having a hard time driving everything evenly. Now we get our overdrive gear. We shift in the six, and this is still happening from the rear gear set. If you remember back in the old gear set rules, if you ever input a carrier, overdrive must occur, because since the carrier acts as the biggest gear, if it's the input, it's got to drive a smaller gear. If the biggest gear is input, a smaller gear is going to be output. And that's what's happening here towards the back of this transmission uh, and this gear set here. We've got the input as this carrier through the 456 clutch. I'm holding my sun gear. So my output is my internal gear, ring gear. It's a large gear driving a medium sized gear. So you get your minimum overdrive and that's the overdrive that we get in this transmission. And it works well, does its job. And then lastly in sixth gear, my two six clutches are gonna apply, and my four five six clutch is the input, and then that gives us the overdrive. You can see the output is spinning faster. I'm trying to come apart on me a little bit. So really lastly is reverse. I almost forgot to cover reverse. Reverse is also happening with the rear gear set. So really, fifth, sixth, and reverse breaks it down to just a simple sun gear carrier and internal gear assembly it's pretty easy you got all these gear sets but really those three reverse fifth and um, sixth gear all breaks down to just what's happening in this rear gear set and what is happening in this case is that we've got our input shaft is delivering torque to that rear sun gear that's our input component and our low reverse clutch is holding this rear carrier middle internal gear assembly so by holding depending on you know it's if i hold one i hold both just like i mentioned earlier so i'm holding this rear carrier assembly whenever you hold a carrier you, you must have reverse rotation because you've got this external gear it's going clockwise it causes these planetary pinions to spin counterclockwise because they're externally toothed gears meshing against each other one spins one way the other is going to spin the other way and since the carrier is held the carrier can't move just the little planet gears can spin now when you have an internal gear riding up against an external gear, they rotate in the same direction. So the internal gear or the ring gear um, in the rear gear set, since the planets are going counterclockwise, so will the uh, internal gear. That's how they get reverse. Probably more than you really needed to know about that, but that is how they do it. You hold a carrier and you will get reverse and they do that by applying this little reverse clutch and that holds the rear carrier and then they drive the sun gear and there you have it. Powerful. It's a beautiful thing. For reverse, I have to apply and drive my 3.5R clutch, and I have to hold my low reverse. And that will give me my reverse reduction. And you can see that by looking at the output gear, the output splines, and the input shaft. They're going the opposite direction. That's what reverse does for us. Works perfect. My 1, 2, 3, 4 clutch holds the front sun gear assembly. My low reverse clutch holds the middle internal gear rear carrier assembly. The 2.6 clutch holds the rear sun gear. The 3.5R clutch drives the rear sun gear. And the 4.5.6 clutch drives the rear carrier middle internal gear. There's a lot of connections there. That's why I like that little line drawing that I show you guys is because you really can't see those gears when you're looking at just like a mock-up and um, you know me describing it in a video. So you almost have to visualize these gears and how they're interconnected. Um, and that's the purpose of drawing it out like I did on paper. And you could do that with any gear set. I, the mo most complicated one I've ever done that on so far is the Honda 10 speed. So if you get the privilege of going through that transmission, try to figure out the gear ratio of that transmission in a few different gears. That's pretty tough. So now that we went through power flow and we got an idea of what's driving what, what's holding what, and how they're being held and driven for each individual gear, 
let's look at these clutches themselves. This is a, what you would call like a job description. And um, it includes this range reference chart. And this is the Ford version of the range reference chart. So you can see they label things with direct, overdrive, forward, low reverse. But luckily enough, if you can't remember what they're applied in, underneath it, they say, they call it a C. That means it's a clutch. And it's using 3, 5, and R. And then the overdrive is a 4, 5, and 6, and they call it a C. So those are actually driving clutches. Those are my input clutches. And those are the ones that are located in this input shaft there towards the end. Then they call these, they call these CB, clutch brakes. That's another term for a holding clutch. So a clutch brake is going to be something that holds something to the case. And the clutch brakes are going to be located in the case. And we've got the one, two, three, four. We've got the low reverse. And then we have the two, six in that order. Um, but we'll see more of that coming up. And the one-way roller clutch is in there. And it's combined kind of the low reverse clutch kind of works with that. This drawing right here, I know, is probably pretty confusing to look at because you got a lot going on there in a little space. But they do highlight the areas that uh, kind of where those clutches live. This is the 3.5R, and it's using third, fifth, and reverse. The 3.5R is the clutch that on the GM units, not in the Ford, but the GM units, the wave plate li lives on the bottom of it. It breaks, and when it falls apart, it kind of destroys the drum that it rides in. It beats it up real bad. We'll see more on that later when we deal with the common issues. The 456 is also a driving clutch and it's located in that rear drum assembly and it's applied in 4th, 5th, and 6th. They got the Ford name there, Overdrive. Even though really Overdrive is only 6th gear. I don't really like using the Ford terms. I just call it whatever they, like the 35R, 456, 1, 2, 3, 4. That seems just as easy and you don't have to do any little decoding to figure out what it is. The one, two, three, four clutch assembly is located towards the front of the gear set. It's actually the last one that we pull out on these 6F50, 6T70s because we kind of work from the back down. But uh, it, you know, it lugs on to this hub section right here of that gear set and spline to that shell is this sun gear assembly. And these teeth on our clutch discs are what grab onto these lugs of that drum assembly. The low reverse holding clutch is going to, this, uh, low, this low reverse holding clutch assembly that we see right here, it ends up being built onto the low reverse one-way clutch. Um, it holds the inner race of that low reverse one-way clutch is gonna support that middle internal gear rear carrier assembly. And so this little, these little spline sections that live on the outside of that inner race of that one-way clutch is what the clutch discs themselves are going to grab onto. So that way when this piston applies and locks this clutch, it basically locks the inner race to the uh, transmission case and the inner race is lugged to the gear set. One thing that's worth noting is, and I know it might be kind of hard to decipher by looking at this picture, but Ford does it a little different than GM. They put this tab on this plate. You could see it down here too. Let me erase all this extra stuff. So this big tab that you see right there, and it kind of has a little nub on it. There's a blow up of it right there. It's actually on the top. It's in three pictures there. How about that? Well, that is going to separate the snap ring opening. So the snap ring that retains this one-way clutch assembly down into the case, there's a snap ring that goes along the edge on top of it, right along that part. You need to put the opening in this lug assembly because when you put this plate in, that little nub's got to fit in here. So if you put the snap ring opening in the wrong spot, that plate won't sit flat and you're going to screw something up putting it together. So don't do that. So the 2.6 clutch, if you're working on a 6F50 or a 6T70 and you pull that end cover off, the 2.6 clutch is the first clutch that you see. And it oh, its job there is to hold that rear sun gear assembly from spinning. A lot of these have this tab that you see on these plates, and those tabs face towards the bottom of the transmission. That really helps identify and locate the position of these clutches and steels. Sometimes the replacement plates that you get don't have those tabs. You can still figure it out, but the tabs make it a little easier. The low one-way clutch is a ratchet 
type clutch. It's uh, also called a diode sometimes. And it sounds like a ratchet. If you grab a ratchet and spin it around, that's what it sounds like. Surprisingly, you can't hear that in the transmission uh, but because it does make a racket. When this is in its proper position, it's going to prevent a gear set from spinning counterclockwise, but it's going to allow it to spin clockwise. And it's used in first gear when you go to take off. The reason why they like to use these one-way clutches is because, especially in low gear like first gear, that when you go to accelerate and take off, all they have to do is concentrate on the one-two shift is applying one clutch, and then that just automatically starts freewheeling. When you go together with it, the middle internal rear and rear carrier assembly is gonna lug into it. That's what's happening here. So the middle internal rear carrier assembly, which is a kind of a combined gear set, it's gonna fit into those lugs on the inside. Those are deep lugs, but really the only part that it grabs onto is right up here. And that's actually a pretty good clue when you're assembling it to see if you've got things stacked up right, like if you have a thrust washer in the wrong spot or maybe the one, two, three, four clutch assembly is not down all the way, is there's a little taper there and it's pretty flo at the bottom of that taper on the one-way roller clutch or on the one-way ratchet clutch, it should be pretty close to flush with the top of that gear set there, the rear carrier slash middle internal gear. A little tip for you. So that was really it for the mechanical slash power flow on this transmission. And uh, the next lecture is gonna focus on the electronics and the hydraulics. And that's when we get to see not only how the electronics work, but how these hydraulic valves work, and then how companies like Transgo and Sonics, how they're correcting for valve body or hydraulic wear in this transmission.